This is Andrew Stotts of A. Stotts Investment Research talking about our value model and looking at the company Zhongsheng Group Holdings, a Chinese company listed in Hong Kong. So today's topics, I'm going to go through the background, the forecast, some absolute valuation, relative valuation, and then we'll look at sensitivity. But before we do, remember this example was created on the 16th of January. 2017. What follows is not a valuation forecast rating or recommendation, rather it's a teaching example. What follows is not investment advice, rather it's a teaching example. It is intended only as academic information to those who want to learn about valuation. It should be not, not be construed as the basis for any valuation or investment. The information in this presentation came from various sources, which we believe are reliable, though we do not guarantee the accuracy, adequacy, or completeness of such information. And lastly, I hope you enjoy learning about valuation as much as I do. So let's get on with the show. Bank, uh, the background on this company is that Zhongsheng Group Holdings Limited is a leading automobile retailer in China. The group distributes luxury and mid to high end automobiles from well known brands. The company has more than 200 dealerships over 70 cities in 20 provinces. It was the first to have dealership rights for Toyota and one of the first dealerships for Lexus and Audi in China. <clears throat> Mercedes Benz launch of the new E Class is expected to increase margins due to its high retail price. Also, business plans for stores to standardize operation and reduce average inventory days start to show results as finance costs fell 20% year on year in first half of 2016. Now let's look at the revenue breakdown of the company and we can see that luxury car sales accounted for 59% and mid to high end car sales 29% and then after sales service 12%. So let's get into the forecast section of the uh, valuation. And as I always say, valuation is about 90% forecast and about 10% valuation. So let's take a look at it. And here we can see a little bit about the company. Now let me get my pen so I can make a few marks. Hold on one second. There it is. And I am going to highlight a few things right here. The first thing is that we can see revenue continuing up. And what you can see is I've kept revenue growth pretty slow, not particularly fast, but if we look back here, the company's revenue growth has been accelerating. Will that con trend continue? Well, it was a pretty tough time at this point. In fact, that brings us to the next thing, which is the net profit growth, which was pretty uh, volatile and large. And we can see the negative period of time that we saw that coming from uh, a tough time domestically that the, that the uh, Chinese market had. And then what I'm going to forecast is that net margin recovers to about 3 and then up to about 3.8%. So it's not overly optimistic, but it is optimistic that things are going to get better for the company. So now let's take a look at the assets of the company and understand a little bit about what's going on. First of all, they I'm expecting that they'll tighten slightly their receivables collections. And the company is trying to reduce the number of days uh, that it takes for them to convert the inventory, which is the cars. They've already bought it from 54.5 down to 43.7. So I'm going to be a little bit pessimistic and say that's going to rise slightly there. And the rest of this we can see is the growth in total assets, which is, let's say, about 10% and then ta uh, tailing down to about 7% or so. And one of the measures I like to look at is how is my uh, growth in my revenue relative to the growth of my assets. So the company has been generating more revenue per assets in place, and I expect that that's going to basically stay flat from where it is right now. So now let's continue on and look at the financing of the company. And one of the things we can see on the liability side is that they do have a lot of short term borrowing. And I think that's going to remain. In fact, the company doesn't do a lot of long term borrowing. And that may be something that changes over time, depending on what's happening with interest rates at that time. And <clears throat> what we can also see is that the company's dividend payout ratio has been, let's say, 15 to 20 percent. And I'm going to bring it up to. 25 by that period of time 
All right, so now let's look at the cash flow statement. And the things that I look at very carefully in cash flow is what's happening with the networking capital. And when you're forecasting any company, networking capital is really an outcome of your forecast. Sometimes it can be a bit strange. So you want to make sure that it's, it's usually negative. And uh, the point is, is that this is an investment for growth. And then you've got CapEx, which you can see um, increasing steadily over time. And so if we continue, we can now look at the absolute valuation. The first thing we want to do is take those forecasts and then produce a free cash flow output. So with free cash flow, the things that I look at are the CapEx, which we just talked about right there, and the change in the working cap. The result of those two things, plus that notepad item and adding back the depreciation, gives us free cash flow to the firm, which is right here. And then, of course, in my model, I'm always looking at a fade period of, of, of about five to ten years. And this is just showing the first two years of that fade period. And so we can understand what's happening with the free cash flow for that period. Now, the company has seen a recovery in the return on invested capital. And I think that that's going to continue. That's what we're forecasting in here. And we can see the amount of invested capital that's in the company the earnings per share is going to grow at, let's say, 49, 11, 15 percent. And because dividend payout ratio is going to rise slightly, particularly in 2021, the amount of growth in dividend per share is very high. So we always want to be careful when we're increasing our dividend payout ratio to do it gradually. Otherwise, you get these massive jumps that may or may not really make sense. And my gosh, who really knows anything about what's going to happen in 2021 anyways? All right, so let's move on to the cost of capital assumptions. And here, um, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the Hong Kong uh, market return because that's where the company is listed. And what we can see is that the market risk-free rate has been about 1.5 to 2%, but I'm going to say, well, that's going to go up. It's been an unusually low period over time. I'm going to use... 3%, remembering that everything that we put into this column is to infinity, right? And the market equity risk premium of 7%. Well, first of all, its equity risk premium estimate based upon a dividend discount model is about 7%. And the equity risk premium based upon survey results from a research paper that we've looked at uh, is about 7%. So based on those, I'm going to keep it simple and choose 7%. And as I always say, the most important thing is to kind of check your result. Yes, it was a negative market return. Then it was 4 and 4.9. So should we say that it's going to be the average of that? Well, I don't think that that necessarily makes sense. So what I'm looking at is what is the actual di discount rate that we want to discount from now to infinity. And that is I'm going to choose 10%. The company's beta is somewhat of a high beta, so I'm going to choose 1.25, and that gives me a cost of equity of 11.8. Now, it is the case that they have a uh, tax rate that's reasonably high, about 25%, and they're financing, I'm going to say, about 50% from debt, which means that the cost, the weighted average cost of capital of about 8.1 is, is pretty, pretty much lower than the 11.8 uh, that we see there. Now, the next thing we have to do is choose a fade period. And so I've chosen a fade period of five years. And <clears throat> we can look at the return on invested capital and say, let's say it was 11%. But the fade period, we're going to show that the return on invested capital at fade period means 8.1. Remember, that was the weighted average cost of capital. So the fade is not going to fade down. The ROC is not going to fade down to a premium. There is no premium or discount. It's going to fade down to weighted average cost of capital, about 8.1. Finally, we have the growth of the cash flows at the terminal period. And remember that this growth item depends on what cash flow we're talking about. That could be dividends or that could be the uh, growth in the free cash flow. The result of this is that we're going to get a multiples that we're going to use for that terminal value of about 19 and a half and about 11.4. So if we look at that, <clears throat> we can now see the fading that we're doing right here of NOPAT as we fade down the 
uh, return on invested capital. So what output does this produce from an absolute valuation perspective? Well, you can see in this chart that the price is about 9.3, DDM gives 6.1, and DDM tends to be understated a bit compared to the others. Uh, free cash flow to uh, the firm is about 7, and free cash flow to equity is about 13.6. Now, there's a few things that we would look at to kind of question and debate about. The first one is that 58% of the value in the DDM comes from the terminal period. Remember, I said that the multiple was a little bit high, so maybe we adjust that. Could be. The other thing is we can see that the company does have a lot of debt, and so we're going to reduce the corporate value by the amount of debt to get the shareholder value. And that means that the uh, present value of the terminal value is about 133% of the total uh, price of or value that we come up with of about seven. So, and then finally, what we can see on this side, without that big skewedness of that debt, we can see the free cash flow to equity at 29,281, which gives a value of about 13.6. Well, that's quite a range from six to almost 14. How about relative valuation? Does that provide us any guidance? So it's 6 to 14. Well, let's first look at P.E. to growth. And remember, P is what you pay in price for one in earnings. And it is a simple and commonly used measure. We compare a company against its sector in its country, its region, and its sector worldwide. And our research shows that a company compared against itself over time is less valuable measure than comparing it against, for instance, other companies. P does not take into consideration future investments needed to maintain earnings growth. That's what free cash flow does. So the company's 2017 EPS times the company's PE, uh, the country's, sorry, the country's PE in 2017. Well, that's at 20 times versus the company's, which is at nine. That would give a value of 20.19. Now, remember, we were at a range of six to 14, and all of a sudden we're at 20.9. However, we may have a reason to say, well, it shouldn't rank at such a high multiple, and there's many different debatable reasons, though we can say, well, the EPS of the growth is going to be pretty strong, but someone may say, well, that was just kind of a one-off, and now it's going to be at about industry average. It could also be that in Hong Kong, there's a lot of domestic companies that are listed, and that's the... PE multiple is higher for them than it is for Chinese companies. Lots of questions that could be raised by this, but based upon on the absolute surface of things, it appears to be cheaper on a PE to growth basis, and part of that's because of this large growth. Now let's look at price to book, and what we can see is price to book is especially useful for firms where assets are the core driver for earnings, which makes it a good ratio for sector-specific comparison. As book value for tangible assets are stated at historic costs, price to book has limited significance indicating what the economic value of the company is. Now, the price to book multiple of Hong Kong consumer sector for 2017 times the company's 2017 book value per share results in a value of, oh my gosh, look at that, 17. Could it really be 17? That gives us a range in this of 17 to 20. When Remember, we talked in the absolute valuation, we had a range of 6 to 14. So which is it? Well, that depends. And we can see the current share price is about 7 right now. So it is hard to say that this company is, is really cheap compared to uh, the overall market. There's more questions that this raises. Now let's look at sensitivity analysis, and I look at sensitivity re related to growth and sales and margin, the discount rate, and the terminal growth rate. And the key thing on this chart is just to show that a gross margin of this company is very low. So significant changes, a five percentage points change is pretty significant, and that can pretty easily bring the company into a negative net margin or a negative ROE. And so we have to be careful in our forecasting on that gross margin. And we can see also that from a free cash flow, for instance, to equity perspective, it can be uh, a m massive swing from almost no value to about 18. Peg ratio is almost always super volatile, and we can see that that continues there. So it's a hard one to just apply randomly. So 
there you go. That's the value of the company as best that I can go, come up with. So I hope that you learn from that and have a great day.